Welcome to the Flight Club Podcast, a woman's guide to leaning out. We give you a behind-the-scenes look at business launch and growth through the stories of successful female entrepreneurs. Here's your host, Felina Hansen, founder and CEO of Hera Hub. Hello and welcome. I am excited to share my conversation with Angelica Sharma. She is a award winning filmmaker. She is also a photographer and a writer. She is based right here in San Diego. Angelica uses images to tell stories about brands, people, and places. She makes corporate videos, speaker reels, documentaries, and also fiction films. And she has a soft spot for female entrepreneurs. And she really, in particular, has a soft spot for those women who are trying to make the world a better place. Welcome to the show today. Uh, Thank you so much, Felina. It's so exciting to be here talking to you. I am excited to share your story. So you have quite a journey. Take us back and uh, talk to us about, you know, your early years. And of course, we'll get into the work you're doing today. But I, we, we like to share the story behind the entrepreneur first. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. Thanks for the opportunity to have me tell my story. It's, um, it, it just it feels good to be heard in, you know, in life. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. To create this stage for all of us women to tell our stories. I think it's beautiful. Um, I will go back to early days. Um, I was born in, in Russia, interestingly, and I Mm. grew up in Mumbai, India. So we moved, my father was transferred there for a year and I happened to pop out. That was kind of an interesting story about me because that's how I got my name. Angelica is kind of like a Indo-European name, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, Anjali means an offering to God, and Angelica is a small offering to God. And the reason my parents thought about naming me Angelica was because my dad watched some French movies with a, a woman who was an adventurer called Angelique. So oh he was <laughs> very taken up by the adventurous side of this woman and felt like his third daughter, with three sisters, I'm the youngest of three, you know, would be an adventure of sorts because I appeared uh, unplanned for unannounced <laughs> seven <laughs> years after my older sister. <laughs> so the adventure of our family began with me in a way. Um, and so I was born in Russia and then we were only there till I was about a year old. And then I grew up uh, primarily in, in, in India. Uh, Mumbai was my hometown. And uh, we had a middle class family. My father was in the Indian Navy. My mother was a school teacher. She taught uh, seventh grade math and science. So I grew up with role models of, you know, working parents um, who worked hard to put food on the table. And, you know, they were very connected with the community, especially my, my mother. From early on, she would do, you know, in India, there's a lot of... Uh, inequality in income and Mm -hmm. many you know we're surrounded by poverty and surrounded by people who are less fortunate and from a very young age my mother instilled in us that we have to give back Mm -hmm. and we have to do whatever we can in our power to make the world better so you know she always said that you know no matter what it is even if it's something small there's always something you can do to make somebody else happy and make their lives better so be thankful for what you have and always pay it forward and I feel like that kind of just stuck with me in my life. Um, and, you know, as time went on, I went to school in Mumbai and, uh, I, I, you know, I had a typical middle class upbringing. And there was a movie that came out in 1989 called um, Salam Bombay. Mm. And it was directed by a female director called Mira Nair, who most people are familiar with. And watching that movie when I was, I think, 15 at the time, was just a revelation to me because for the first time on the screen, the story, you know, it follows a group of street children who live on the streets in Mumbai. Uh, at the time it was called Bombay. Um, and how they, despite their hardship and what they are going through in life, they always have a smile on their faces mm-hmm. and they kind of were a team. They kind of stuck together and they had each other's back. <laughs> and I just loved that story of camaraderie and of, 
you know, reality. Like I felt like for the first time I was seeing reflected on the screen what I saw around me, you know, when I went to school by bus or I was, you know, in the city, I would see people living in slums or I would, I would see it around me. And I felt like the movies that we watched in India up to that point, the Bollywood movies, which there's a place mm-hmm. for them, but it was more <laughs> entertainment and fun and, you know, uh, fantasy, love stories, romances. And I do love those movies, but seeing this was like, wow, you know, this is what I want to do. Like, I never mm-hmm. knew that I wanted to do that. But when I saw that, I was like, I want to tell stories about reality in a way that's accessible to people and for them to emotionally connect with stories, you know, of those who are not as seen, you know, in the mainstream. So that was kind of my journey into film. And, you know, I, I went to, to school, uh, to college, I studied economics and psychology, and I, I always like to write um, stories. And I gravitated towards film school. Um, I did a first did like a course after college, um, which was a communications course, in which we did, you know, radio, television, film, journalism, the gamut of communications. And uh, I just fell in love with film, you know, watching, uh, you know, the neuralistic cinema of Italy in the 50s reminded me of, you know, Satyajit Ray in, in, in Kolkata telling again true stories tied right up with, you know, Mira Nair telling these stories of reality in the 80s. And I was like, okay, this is it. <laughs> this is my, <laughs> my space, you know. Um, and so I um, finished film school and my, um, I went to film school in Kolkata in the east of India in, in a film school called the Satyajit Ray Film and Television Institute. And I was one of, um, there was a six women in totality in the whole class out of 32 people of Mm. which two were directors and I was a director chosen as a direction student and I went on to make a film which was uh, 37 minutes long uh, called Nina Jha which is the name of um, oh you know a girl's name Mm -hmm. and uh, I won a national award for that film uh, from the president of India and it was the best debut of a director for a non-feature length film um, completely unexpected and totally. That's amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. It, it was pretty amazing. I was like, what? <laughs> because it, it was amazing more so because I didn't feel like I was trying very hard. I was just having fun with it. You know, mm-hmm. I was talking about what I knew and what was inside of me. And, you know, it's, it keeps coming back to that, like as an artist or as a creator, um, you know, when we go within ourselves and are able to speak our truth, it's always the right thing. You know, when you're trying to do things for other people or trying to please, um, you know, someone else, it's never quite the right thing. You know, but with yeah. my film, Meena Jha, I was just like, I want to tell a story about two young girls who are teenagers. One is from a rich family and one is from a middle class family. And what does that clash bring about? You know, mm-hmm. what does their friendship look like? And I don't think anybody would care about this film, but apparently people cared about it. Um, and so anyway, I finished that. And then, you know, as, uh, as luck and life would have it, we, I moved from uh, India to the U.S. to marry my high school sweetheart, who uh, mm-hmm. his name is Dhaval. And he and I met when we were 16. And then he came to New York State to study. And we were kind of in a long distance relationship for a little while. And it was like, you know, are we going to make this work or not? Is it going to happen or not? Mm. Um, but I feel like finally we just kind of were meant to be together. You know, we were in a way like we, you know, there are some people that you meet in the world that the moment you meet them, it's like family. You know, it feels so um, natural. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that was always my husband and I, you know, um, just a natural connection. And so I kind of followed him here. Um, and when I first moved to the U.S., I, we got married August 11, 2001, and I was on a dependent visa at the time. I remember we lived in Burlington, Vermont, and, you know, I was kind of at home, and he had gone to work, and he called me up, and he said, put the TV on a month after we were married, mm-hmm. and I remember I put the TV on. It was September 11, 2001, mm-hmm. um, and it suddenly, everything was different, you know, um, mm-hmm like like everybody in the world i couldn't believe what i was seeing on the screen and watching it over and over again and still not quite believing what i was seeing um and that sort of i feel like that was a point of inflection in many ways in many people's lives right you yeah. Yeah. um 
before and after. Um, and I feel like my journey in America, you know, the America that I was kind of looking towards when I was in India, when Tawal first came here, was in many ways a different America than, than it became after, you know, September 11th. Um, yeah. I mean, in good ways and bad ways, you know. Um, yeah. I think people came closer together and, uh, you know, people understood the value of life and, you know, we had deeper conversations about what was wrong with the world. Um, I mean, we're still not in a perfect place, but I just feel like that opened up a lot of, a lot of conversations about the truths that happen in, in our world, you know. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of a tangent. But, you know, for initially when I was first here, I was not able to work because I was on a dependent visa. And then, you know, this happened. And then I was sitting on my, you know, national award from India unable to work and I had like a camera that my my father and my husband put money together and bought for me <laughs> mm. my first little video camera the Canon GL1 I remember um <laughs> and I was they were like just do something just go you know be free do your thing um <laughs> and I remember I I started doing like just volunteer filming for the Salvation Army and there was like this women's group um you know they had a a home for a, it was called Women's Center of Hope uh, it was a home for women who were escaping domestic violence situations mm -hmm. and they lived together. And so I made like a little ad for them. Everything was pro bono. And then somebody in Vermont heard about this, this you know, crazy Indian lady who had a camera and was working for free. <laughs> 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 and so uh, before long, um, somebody called me and said, hey, there's a group called the Vermont Campaign to End Childhood Hunger. And they're looking to make a video to raise funds. Are you interested? And I said, yes, I'll do it. I'm, I want to work. <laughs> and so <laughs> I made uh, my first little documentary in Burlington, Vermont. I kind of traveled all over the state for 10 months. And I, I was surprised with the topic. You know, I didn't think that there was hunger in America or hunger in yeah. Vermont for that matter. But I was yeah. surprised. It was eye-opening to see, again, you know, my, my life kind of leads me to the stories that aren't usually told, you know, the forgotten yeah. or the hidden. Um, and so that was a revelation to me, you know, to see what exists around me. Um, so I made that film and, you know, I received an award for that. It was the uh, Marianne Metropolis um, Humanitarian of the Year Award for making mm -hmm. the film for the organization. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I, you know, from there we moved on. I, um, we moved to Austin, Texas. Uh, well, actually, I'm sorry, my my bad. We, from that point, uh, two years after that, in 2003, I got authorization to work. Mm. Um, and I was doing a course in Burlington College in editing. And the teacher there, you know, he thought I was sort of, you know, very dynamic to work with. He thought I had good ideas. And he worked at PBS. And he offered me a role at the PBS in, in Mountain Lake PBS in Plattsburgh, New York. Mm. Hmm. And he said, you know, we're making a film and it's a film about, uh, there's, a, there's a group called the Media Lab. It's like an after school program for underprivileged kids in the area in Plattsburgh. And we are getting them into PBS and we teach them, give them skills, you know, video and writing and editing skills so they can, you know, do something meaningful and stay out of trouble. And would you like to join us? And I, I said, yes, please. Um, and when I joined that, uh, the media lab, very quickly, um, a documentary came my way that I was contracted to produce. Um, and that documentary is called Unless a Death Occurs. And it was based on um, a death that occurred in SUNY Plattsburgh, where a boy who was pledging a fraternity was hazed to death. And mm. uh, it was a big um, story. It was sad. And it was, uh, you know, um, it shook the whole town up. And as part of the sentencing, the DA at the time, um, Cantwell, Richard Cantwell, he sentenced that all of the 11 fraternity brothers who were, you know, implicated in the death of this boy had to come on camera and talk about their role, you know, in this hazing incident. incident. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like a, you know, accept what you did on camera. Um, and there was sort of like a... You know, people thought it was, oh, it's just like a slap on the wrist. You know, they're not really getting punished enough kind of thing. But I just kind of took it and ran with it because I just was completely blown away. And I had never heard of something like this, you know, that a kid, they basically made him, 
funnel so much of water. They were making him drink tons of alcohol and do exercises and all of this stuff. And then they made him funnel water so much that the, his brain expanded to the point oh where he, he died of that. Oh it was gosh. just, it was devastating to kind of hear about that. And, you know, to think that these parents would have sent their kid to college, 18 years old, you know, brought him up all this time. And within the first month of, of school, this happens. So I kind of went after that story in a big way and I, you know, made it more national. I went and spoke to hazing experts in Indiana and in Maine. Um, and we talked to, you know, talked to high school kids and middle school kids about hazing and bullying. We kind of, you know, broadened the scope of it. And yeah. so the film was well appreciated and it was shown in last, I know it's, it's still shown as a required viewing when, when kids are pledged into a fraternity, when they're deciding to join a fraternity. Many mm. college libraries around the country have it and, you know, kids watch it. Um, and it was shown in 57 stations, I think, across the, the U.S. Um, so that was kind of like a big, you know, proud moment for me to be able to make like a, you know, produce a PBS documentary. Um, I don't know if this is too much detail, Selena. Is it too much detail? No, this is perfect. Okay. No, absolutely. Okay. No, I, I'm, I just, I'm. I mean, I just want to pause here for a sec, though, because, you know, <laughs> I think filmmaking and and video and, and all of that together is so underappreciated because, <laughs> you know, you, as you're describing this, this film you made and yeah. all the work that not only goes into storytelling crafting the story, getting the right players, coordinating the filming, doing the filming, editing all of this, you know, documentation yeah. that you have, I'm sure, you know, hundreds, thousands, sometimes of hours, you know, down yes. to, you know, an hour or even two hours. I mean, that yeah. is such, there's so much skill and different skills that have to come together yeah. to do that I, it's it, people just don't understand <laughs> thank you so much for saying that I mean I think so I think it takes you know what you what you don't show is as much a part of the story as what you do show you know very rightly so because there's so many decisions that you make you know about you know what are you what is the story here and you know based on the story everything everything goes around the emotional arc of the viewer, you know, what, what am I trying to say here? What do I want the viewer to feel here? Um, and yeah, I, I, it, it is a lot <laughs> to, to really get into. Um, and I, I thank you for, for appreciating that. Um, you know, I, I went on after this film, I made a second documentary for Mountain Lake PBS. And that was a completely different story. It was based on, uh, it was called Call of the Loon. And it was based on an aquatic bird that's found in northeastern lakes um, in New York State and in Minnesota and other states and also in Europe. And it's this prehistoric looking bird, black and white, gorgeous, with like a beady red eye. And it has this haunting call that's called the tremolo. And in fact, if you most movies that have a scary night track will have like a low loon sound in the background. <laughs> now that I've made the film, I recognize it. I'm like, hey, <laughs> there's no loons. <laughs> There's no loons in Texas. <laughs> but anyway, um, and so this film followed kind of the story of um, how mercury pollution from coal-fired power plants affects the habitats of the birds in the Northeast, you know, because the pollution kind of goes over and their eggs uh, kind of get thinner over time and they get uh, mercury poisoning as they eat fish that has these biotoxins in them and, you know, and, and up the food chain they get impacted in that they have lesser successful, you know, um, chicks. And so mm -hmm. I studied this bird and went out in the middle of the night on these boats and tried to follow these birds. It's so cool. <laughs> I just loved it. There was this group that kind of took me under their wing and it was called the uh, Adirondack uh, Loon, uh, Adirondack Cooperative Loon Program. Yeah, ACLP, uh, run by this incredible woman called Nina Shock who is just like, you know, she's like, uh, what she's done for loons and for birds and just for the habitat in the Northeast is an unsung story. You know, she's an incredible environmentalist. Um, and she's been fighting for these birds for years now. 
And so I made that film. Um, and then at the end of that film, I was pregnant with my first child. <laughs> um, and we then moved again with my husband's job and we moved um, to Austin, Texas. Um, Austin, Texas, I took kind of like a little bit of a break. You know, I raised my kiddos. I have two kids. My mm-hmm. daughter uh, is 13, Annika, and my son Arjun is 10. And I just, you know, I just, completely went into mothering. I had no idea it would hit me like, like that. I was just like, wow, <laughs> here are these kids. <laughs> They're mine. <laughs> awesome. it was just, it's, it's been, yeah, I mean, I just had a burst of creativity with the kids. You know, they were just fun to be with. Um, I, you know, having, if I would have done it slightly different, I probably would have gotten back into the workforce sooner, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that would have been in a way more practical at the time for my career, but oh well, you know, you live and learn. Um, no, but you know, you I, only, I wouldn't. Yeah, you only have such little time too. I mean, I, I have those conversations with mothers all the time, and, and no regrets. I mean, you you can't. You've got a whole life in front of you. You can never get that time back. So true. It's <laughs> so true. Like I just. I look at some of the videos and pictures from that time and their little voices and, you know, how they spoke to us and how they loved me. Like, I've never been loved like that, you know, <laughs> just when your child loves you. It's such a beautiful thing. It's so, like, love is such an important thing in life. And I feel like I kind of packed it all in, you know. And that was a, a I, I feel grateful to have had that and to still have that. To be lucky enough to be a mother. Yeah. You know, so many people aren't able to um, have like a maternal relationship with somebody. And I just think it's been like the most true, most deep, um, hardest loving relationship of my life. And it it still Mm -hmm. continues, you know, (laughs) it's a never ending job. (laughs) Um, Yes. Yeah. And so, yeah. And then um, I guess we moved again to San Diego from Austin in 2013 December I want to say yeah so we've been here about five six years almost in in San Diego um and uh you know since I've been here I've been trying to kind of do more things on my own I've been doing photography and I've been doing videos I one big break I got here was I did a uh some short films for the U.S. Air Force that I met you know I made a connection through somebody I knew in in Burlington Vermont randomly called me from the University of Tennessee and said, oh, we need these films made. I don't know a filmmaker, will you do it? And we had just, I had just moved to California at the time. So when I came here in 2014, I worked on that and made those films. Um, and I've done some other small, like, you know, book trailers and little business films. Um, and I've been writing a lot. Um, I directed a short film. It's been a couple of years now and it's just gotten on Amazon, which is like a big... Mm. You know, it feels so good too. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, it's a short film called May. It's a fiction film. And uh, that came about with a collaboration with a friend, uh, an actress who lives in LA now, Kelsey, Kelsey Fordham. And she and I kind of always bonded and talked about how there's not enough stories about women. You know, we need mm-hmm. to have more. And this is before talking about representation became, you know, as mm-hmm. like as much of a hot topic as, as it is now. It was always mm-hmm. something that I, kind of wanted to see more of you know where are the women where are the women's stories where where are the women directors um and the writers you know and so we got together and we created a movie that was about two women and two sisters and we set it in the in the desert in joshua tree Hmm. and it's called me i'm proud of the film it's it's uh uh it definitely demands you know, attention and heart. It's not like an easy watch film that you can just kind of, you know, watch in the background. It, it, it expects emotional involvement. Um, and I'm happy to have it out there for people to kind of go and click on it and, you know, buy it for one ninety nine. <laughs> plug, plug. <laughs> yes, please plug away. It's available now on Amazon? It's up. It is available now on Amazon. Okay. Yes, I should probably send you a link um, yes, to the you show. <laughs> we'll include it in the yeah. show notes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, other than that, you know, I've been doing family pictures, you know, um, professional, you know, personal brand photography. Um, and I just, I wrote a short film that's probably going to be 
shot in February by a local director. That was very exciting. It's a very, I, I can't talk much about it because it's under wraps, but I was okay. excited to write that short film. Uh, and then a friend of mine and I um, are writing a TV series that we hope to present um, to Netflix India. Um, and I also have written a pitch for a show that I want to make about Indian American characters living in, in California. You know, I feel like there's just the kind of representation I see of Indian Americans is just, you know, it's, it's archaic. It's not what I see around me. And I really would love to shift that, you know, just with, with humor and fun and intelligence and, you know, just tell like a multicultural, multi-generational story um, with Indian American characters in lead with others, but, you know, I want them to be featured prominently. Um, so that's the other exciting thing I'm doing. Um, and, you know, I continue, you know, in order to pay for the, the bacon, <laughs> I still have to do, you know, I love to do like speaker reels or, um, you know, videos for female entrepreneurs. And, you know, every, everywhere I look, video is, you know, the biggest thing in marketing. It's, it is. It is. And I want to I want to pause on that because mm -hmm. I, you're right. I mean, it's it is the platform. I mean, you you had the foresight <laughs> to see that it would be <laughs> the platform of the future. Um, yeah. You know, any I don't know. I mean, this is such a broad topic, but just any advice that you have for entrepreneurs that are, you know, trying to use video in their business, thinking about using video in their business, um, mm -hmm. just anything you that comes to mind that, that would be helpful. Yeah. You know, I, I think that um, the reason that video works now more than, you know, I, there's a place for, you know, uh, like heavily produced video, you know, for like as an ad for, you know, a company or for your product. And there's definitely a space for that. But I think that consumers and people who are using your product or who, you know, look to you for, for your, uh, you know, to your business, like to see you, you know, I think that authentic videos, just kind of talking to your target market is, is something that people love to see. Like, I love to see it as a consumer. Like, I, I want to see you talking to me. I want to know who you are. You know, yeah. I'm okay with you doing a Facebook Live video. Um, I do like to hear the videos well, though. I get a little <laughs> bummed when I, when I, you know, when there's wind sound. And I'm like, this is not working. It needs to, yes. it needs to yeah. sound some, good as well. You know? Basics, um, be in a quiet place, have a, some, you know, yeah. some stability and, and, <laughs> That that does drive me yeah. crazy too. When someone's like holding their phone and the, moving it around all over the place, oh I'm getting gosh, yeah. watching it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just basic. I think it's just common sense, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I do think that there's a place for um, you know videos that are more storytelling. You know, I yep. think that I think that you shouldn't wait to get videos started. I think you should just get on your phone and start you know making videos for your consumers. But you should also, and this is not just because I'm a filmmaker and I would like to produce videos, but I think there's something to be said for telling a story about your, you know, your, yourself. I think there yeah. should be, when you land on a website, I would love to see a profile video of the founder, you know, yes, like nicely yes. produced, you know, sitting in a nice light and, you know, with some B-roll walking down the market, getting a coffee, you know, talking to a child, whatever it may be, just create that person, you know, show the consumer who you are. Um, yeah. you know, I think that that's important. Like, I, I don't want to come to your website and read 20 things. If you can hit me with your elevator pitch, you know, in a nice, clean, simple way, uh, in a minute, I, you know, I would love that. I think that yeah. all consumers kind of relate to that. Absolutely. So, love it. Yeah. Love it. Well, Angelica, mm -hmm. if our listeners want to get in touch with you, you know, learn more about you, what is the best way for them to do that? Sure. So I'm on all the various platforms, but the easiest way to find me would be to find me on Instagram and that's at Indinari and Indinari is basically Indi, I-N-D-I-E, which is, you know, for independent and Nari is the Hindi word for woman. So my name means independent woman. Um, so search for Indinari on Instagram. You also find Indinari on Facebook 
And you should be able to email me through those. It's just my first name at Gmail, Angelica at Gmail, super simple, A-N-J-A-L-I-K-A at gmail.com. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time today. <laughs> Thank you for talking with me, Felina. It's so fun to talk with you. I love how you prepare and, and take the time to have women tell their stories. I, I just think you're such an amazing resource to all of us. Thank you for what you do. Thank you. My, my pleasure. Thank you for joining this week's episode of Flight Club, sponsored by Hera Hub. We look forward to sharing more success stories with you soon. 